All right, so this is the very last section in chapter three, and uh, this section is going to be introducing some new functions that you would not have encountered until this point in your mathematical journey. Um, so uh, the, the functions, as you can see, are called hyperbolic functions, uh, or the longer name is hyperbolic trigonometric functions. So to uh, introduce these functions, we're gonna revisit the trigonometric functions that you learn about. There's six of them, but we're going to start with the uh, the two that you always start with, cosine and sine. So from trigonometry, the way that we learn uh, the definitions of sine and cosine, once you break out of the right triangle definition, is, uh, is that you relate them to points on a unit circle. So <clears throat> if you have the unit circle centered at zero, zero at the origin, and uh, you'd think of the value t as an angle in standard position, which would be an angle whose initial side is on the positive x-axis, then that angle determines a, uh, a sector of the unit circle. So that's shaded here in blue. And in addition to that, it determines a point. So if this is the angle t right here. I can even draw this in, t. Then uh, this point p is determined uniquely by that angle. And we define cosine of t and sine of t to be the x and y coordinates of that point on the unit circle. And then in trigonometry, we show that that connects, that, that, that directly generalizes the right triangle definition of those functions. And you use it for all sorts of things in that class. Okay, now because those functions were defined using a unit circle, we sometimes refer to them as the circular functions or the circular trigonometric functions. Um, it's, that's probably a term you've never heard up until this point because you've been able to just call them the trigonometric functions. The only time we're going to be calling them circular functions is when we need to make a distinction between these functions and the ones we're about to define, which are called the hyperbolic functions. So. Before we can start looking at hyperbolic functions, um, I want to think about this, this uh, image right here. So t, as it appears in the cosine and the sine here, is, as we've said, an angle. We're thinking of t as an angle, and you need to be thinking of that angle as measured in radians for any of this to work. Um, <clears throat> the sector of that circle also is directly related to t. The uh, area of formula for a sector is equal to one half times the radius of that sector squared, so the one half r squared, times the angle that's showing up here, the central angle giving me that sector. That would be t. So one half times r squared times t. But the unit circle has a radius of one, so r squared is still one, which means the area of my sector is actually much simpler. It's a equals one half t. In other words, if this angle t is given in radian measure, then the area of this sector numerically is exactly half of that angle. Um, alternatively, I could say that this angle t is equal to twice the area of that sector. I could write um, t equals 2a, where a is the area of that sector. And so what that means for us is even though I, I in practice, am thinking of t as an angle, I could alternatively think of that t right there as twice the area of the sector that p determines. Now, it seems bizarre that you would ever want to do that. Why would you ever choose to think of t as twice an area? Why not just think of it as an angle? That's, that's proven to be a very useful way of thinking of that t in trigonometry. And the reason it actually has nothing to do with these circular functions, it has to do with how we take that idea and move it into the hyperbolic functions. So if we, if we were to take the equation of our unit circle and make one tiny little change, change that plus into a minus, then the result is a hyperbola. This hyperbola in particular, that's one and negative one right there. Um, if I were to try and adapt this idea to the, from the unit circle to what I could call the unit hyperbola, then I would also be looking at points on that hyperbola whose x and y coordinates I want to uh, use to define the functions that I'm trying to create here. Um, but the problem with that is I'm also trying to kind of interpret this guy right here as an angle. And this uh, this hyperbola has a slant asymptote at y equals x. 
And what that means is that this angle, if you, if you think of this red line as a ray that's shooting out from, or a line segment that's shooting out from the origin to that hyperbola, uh, this angle will increase as this point is brought further out, but only to a limit. It's always going to be less than 45 degrees, or pi over 4. And so if we think of this T as being the same thing as this angle, that's extremely restrictive. We don't have a very large domain for these functions. It would only be from 0 to pi over 4. So instead, we use this alternative definition where instead of defining this T right here to equal that angle, we define this T to be twice this angle area, this blue shaded area right here. Now this blue uh, area, that, that figure there, is called a hyperbolic sector, just like how this would be thought of as a circular sector. And if I interpret t to be twice that area, then the point that determines that hy hyperbolic sector um, is going to be, uh, is going to have an x and a y coordinate equal to what we call hyperbolic cosine of t in hyperbolic sine of t. Um, and then t itself is what's called a hyperbolic angle. Now, this derivation, these terms that I'm introducing here, are not actually going to be relevant for our purposes here because we're not going to be using this derivation of these functions for what we do in calculus, in this level of calculus. In fact, um, I'm going to give you different representations for these functions that we can't even show are equivalent to this definition until you get a ways through a part of the way through calculus two. So we're not really going to be using this derivation of these functions. Like I said, it's, I'm just trying to give you a little bit of background here. So in spite of all of that, uh, this, uh, this function and this function, which we call hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine, you notice it looks like cosine and sine, but with an H after it. And we actually pronounce that the way it looks, cosh and cinch. So even though I could say this is the hyperbolic cosine function, for short, we just call it cosh and cinch, okay? And it turns out that cosh of t is equal to e to the t plus e to the negative t over 2. Cinch of t is equal to e to the t minus e to the negative t over 2. So they look very similar where one has a plus and the other has a minus. These two functions are exactly equal to these, ex these expressions involving the exponential function. And again, like I said, it doesn't seem like there's any natural connection between this expression and the x-coordinate of this point. And making that connection requires you to have been in calculus too and learn some techniques there. So again, we're not going to show the, the actual connection between these two in this class. But this is what's important for you to remember. Now, once we've defined these two functions, we can define the remaining four hyperbolic functions, hyperbolic tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant, the same way that we do it with the circular functions. For example, the hyperbolic tangent function is just cinch over cosh, just like how tangent is sine over cosine, and so on and so forth. So here, I'm gonna give you the definitions of all the hyperbolic functions. We've already stated these two. The hyperbolic tangent function, which I'm going to pronounce tanch, is equal to cinch over cosh. Uh, just like we said, tangent is sine over cosine. It's defined similarly. Hyperbolic cosecant is the reciprocal of hyperbolic sine, which is the done in analogy to cosecant being the reciprocal of sine. Um, similarly, uh, we define hyperbolic secant as the reciprocal of hyperbolic cosine and uh, hyperbolic cotangent as the, uh, as the reciprocal of hyperbolic tangent. So saying hyperbolic cose cosecant, hyperbolic secant, and hyperbolic cotangent, it's, that's a mouthful, so we also shorten the names of these. We pronounce this coseach, seach, and coth. I know that might sound a little bit ridiculous, uh, but that's just, that's just how we do it. That's the convention that we use, okay? Now you could uh, graph these functions, since we have we've put them in terms of exponential functions, cinch and cosh, and because these two functions are given in terms of exponential functions, I could put the rest of these four in terms of exponentials as well. But the the graphs of cinch, cosh, and tanch are shown below, and you can graph these using a, a graphing calculator if you wish. Um, but uh, the red curves in particular are the uh, hyperbolic functions. The blue and green curves that you're seeing in the first two graphs uh, 
are basically acting as asymptotes. And if you look at how they're labeled, y equals one half e to the x is this blue function. Y equals negative one half e to the negative x is this green function. And the cinch function is going to uh, approach this, this guy, one half e to the x, as x goes to infinity, and it's gonna approach negative one half e to the negative x as x moves towards negative infinity. So in that sense, it's acting like asymptotes. Similar things going on for the cosh function right here. We can show why that is relatively easily using the way that cinch and cosh are defined up here, but I, I'd actually rather not use the time for that, so I'm gonna skip the rationale behind these asymptotes. Notice the tangent function looks very similar to the inverse tangent function, actually. It's not the same as that. It's not the same curve, but it has a, it has a resemblance. Um, notice also the tangent function <coughs> has hyperbol uh, sorry, uh, uh, horizontal asymptotes at y equals plus or minus 1. So uh, two different horizontal asymptotes here. <coughs> okay. Um, it's also important to make a note of, based on what we're seeing in these graphs, what the domain and range of each of these functions are. So for all three of these functions, the domain is all real numbers. And that's easy enough to verify by looking at the way these functions are defined up here. Uh, notice that the tanch function, you might expect it to have some discontinuities, some places where it's not defined, because you might look at this and say, well, couldn't cosh of x equals zero, and then I would be dividing by zero here if that's the case. And if you look at the graph of the cosh function, it's never, it never gets below one. So cosh of x is never equal to zero, which is why this is defined everywhere. Um, the range of each of these functions is different though. The range of the cinch function is all real numbers. Range of uh, cosh is all numbers greater than or equal to one. And then the range of the tanch function is the open interval from negative one to one. So I've listed those here, okay? Um, these functions, uh, some of them in particular have useful interpretations uh, in, in the sciences. Uh, cosh is one I wanted to talk about just briefly. In engineering, the cosh function shows up um, anytime you're looking at a hanging wire or a cable. And uh, the reason for that, if you look at this shape, the shape of the cosh function's graph. It's red here, and it looks uh, it looks similar to a parabola, but it's characteristically different from a parabola. This is actually not parabolic at all, even if you kind of are tempted to think that it is. The shape that the cosh function takes on is is a little different. It's called a catenary, and the catenary is the is the natural shape that a hanging wire or a hanging cable will take. Um, this function right here, you notice the cosh makes a, an appearance here, is sort of a, a, a shift and um, a transformation of the cosh function to fit this specific hanging cable here. Um, we're not going to get into you know the details of this, but I'm just mentioning that to show that these functions actually are useful for something. Um, your book also talks about the tanch function uh, in a, in a formula that measures distance between wavelengths of like a, of, a, um, of a ocean waves, but you can read your book for that example if you want. Okay? So because we have now defined these new functions that are defined analogously to our circular, circular trigonometric functions, we would expect a lot of the things that we do with uh, those regular trig functions to uh, show up in the context of hyperbolic functions. So one thing you spend a lot of time doing in trigonometry is proving trig identities. And we can actually do that with the hyperbolic functions as well. There are several, uh, that's not where we are. There are several identities, more than just what's shown here, uh, that pertain to hyperbolic functions. And if you look carefully at them, they look very, very similar to corresponding identities with the circular trig function. So for example, the cinch function is an odd function. Cinch of negative x is equal to negative cinch of x. Similarly, cosh is an even function. That's what this identity is showing. Um, the, this identity here looks very similar to the Pythagorean identity, but it's a little different. Uh, cosh squared of x minus cinch squared of x is equal to one, where the Pythagorean identity would say that cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Notice the minus instead of the plus here. Um, and the reason for that really goes back to how, how we define these functions in the first place. 
The reason the uh, Pythagorean identity works is because if I substitute co cosine of t in for x, sine of t in for y in the equation for um, the unit circle, I, I, get a, I get that identity. See the plus there. When we're talking about hyperbolic functions, there's a minus there. So substituting cosh in for x, cinch in for y, since they represent the x and y coordinates of that point, that's where this identity right here would be coming from. And then we have these other identities as well. We have a sum identity for cinch and cosh here. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to prove one of these. I'm going to prove the first one. How do we prove that cinch of negative x equals negative cinch of x? This just boils down to using the definition for cinch in terms of those exponential functions. So what is cinch of negative x by definition? Well, that would be what I get from plugging a negative x into the uh, cinch function. I've got my h there. That's e to the negative x minus e to the negative negative x, all over 2. Okay. Of course, this is the same thing as e to the negative x minus the negatives cancel. It just gives me e to the x there over 2. And then this almost looks like the definition of the cinch function, but these, these terms on top are in the wrong order. So if I factor a negative out, I can reverse their order. e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2. And then this is negative cinch of x. So that proves that identity. Okay, But notice I'm just using the exponential definitions for these functions to prove these identities. All right, now that we've introduced these functions, we've talked a little bit about them. Uh, now is the time to start doing some calculus. So uh, we're talking about derivatives all throughout chapter three. And now that we've got these new functions, um, which based on their graphs, they look like they would be differentiable functions, we wanna find their derivatives. And so these are the derivatives of the six hyperbolic functions. Um, and we're going to prove one of them here. The rest can be proven in a similar way. Compare these to the derivatives of the uh, circular trigonometric functions. So we know that the derivative of sine is cosine. Similarly, the derivative of cinch is cosh. So that checks out based on what we know about circular trig functions. Uh, what about the deri derivative of cosh? Well, the derivative of cosh of x is cinch of x. And this is almost the same as what we see with circular trig functions, except the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. So notice we never get a negative. What this means is if I start with a cinch function or a cosh function and I just repeatedly take derivatives, I'm going to be alternating back and forth between cinch and cosh, cinch and cosh, never having to go into the negative territory. Um, you can look at the other ones here. They're very similar. So I tanch, for example, has a derivative of sech squared essentially the same thing that happens with the, um, uh, what is it, the, the uh, tangent function. The derivative of tangent is secant squared, right? And then compare these as well to uh, their corresponding derivatives in the circular trig realm. Very, very similar uh, to what you would expect to see, except occasionally we pick up a negative where you normally wouldn't. So let me, let me uh, derive one of these. What is the derivative of cosh? Up here it says that it's cinch, but if we want to derive it, we don't need to go to the limit definition for the derivative. We can just convert cosh to its exponential form and then take the derivative using the way that we know to differentiate exponential functions. So d dx of cosh of x. I'm going to write cosh this way. It's equal to d dx of 1 half times e to the x plus e to the negative x. Of course, this is the same thing as e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. But this way I can look at it as a constant multiple and just differentiate uh, more simply. So I know that the 1 half is going to stay put, and then I take the derivative of these terms independently. Derivative of e to the x is simply e to the x. Derivative of e to the negative x using the chain rule would be negative e to the negative x. And notice this is exactly how cinch is defined, cinch of x. So that's super straightforward. Don't need the limit definition, just use the exponential definitions for these functions, okay? Let's find another derivative, uh, something a tad more complicated. So I wanna find the derivative of e to the x times cosh of x, okay? This, of course, is a product, so I need to use my product rule. 
Uh, this would be equal to the derivative of the first function, which is still e to the x times cosh of x, plus the first function times the derivative of the second function, which we now know is sinh of x. Okay? I could leave this alone, but I, I would like to see if things simplify in any interesting way here. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to write this as e to the x times cosh of x plus sinh of x. I could factor the e to the x out. And then this is equal to e to the x times, let's write these in their exponential form, e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2 plus e to the x over uh, minus e to the negative x over 2. Okay? If I were to add these, I already have a common denominator. And notice the e to the negative x and the negative e to the negative x end up canceling each other. And then if I add these together, I get this. e to the x plus e to the x is 2e to the x over 2. Notice that the 2's cancel out, and I'm left with e to the x times e to the x, or e to the 2x. That simplified a huge amount. And notice the derivative actually looks simpler than the function that we started with. So when you're doing uh, derivatives involving hyperbolic trig functions, a lot of the time you want to you want to go through the effort of simplifying the result because you can oftentimes get something that's a lot easier to work with than what you got after your first step. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop this uh, one here, and we're gonna pick this up where we left off in part two.